Peter chapter number one, uh, verse, uh, I'm sorry, first Peter chapter number two, verse 19 is where we're going to spend our time today. And so we're going to invite you to join us, uh, if you don't mind, uh, in the book of first Peter. First Peter is one of these pastoral letters that was written, uh, some think, uh, in the first generation after Jesus' death, meaning that for many of them, they were experiencing some of the greatest persecution of the early early church, the early followers of the way, as they called themselves, the early followers of the way of Jesus. And Peter uh, was attempting to encourage them on how to live in light of a very adversarial, both uh, religious and governmental response that was indeed searching for many, many Christians, followers of Jesus, and literally persecuting them and putting them to death. And so this is uh, Peter's uh, very much pastoral response. And I think it's always important to appreciate uh, that all of these particular passages have a certain trajectory to them. They are intended, uh, all of them, to give us both theological insight, pastoral insight, uh, some insight around our ethics and our values, ethics and our values of how we to, are to live day to day. They certainly are to give us some, some guidance around our political uh, stewardship of both the nation we live in and the world that we inhabit. And so all of these passages, when put together properly, uh, should add up to life, giving ways of being in the world. One of the great challenges sometimes we have of Scripture is that we can read them so flatly and not appreciate that they all must fit together in a way that produces the highest quality and possibility of life. That is when we are most faithful to God, when we are agents of life and not death. And that is a great barometer for you as you follow Jesus through the course of your life. Am I following Jesus in ways that bring life to those I know and even to those I don't know? In this way, I believe uh, you and I uh, will always have a good uh, measuring stick, a good filter, a good barometer. So First Peter is attempting to figure out how to help navigate some of these tough times. This is the lectionary passage for this week, and I was, I, was, I was torn between a number of different passages because if you read through all the lectionary passages, the book of Acts is the immediate aftermath of uh, the, the day of Pentecost and Peter's great message that uh, I preached and we preached on last week where he told them to save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And we talked a little bit about what does it mean for us to save ourselves. In the immediate aftermath, the response of the people was to gather in homes and to build lives, shared lives, where they had all things in common. So I thought of preaching an economic message about what does it mean for you and I to take seriously uh, that this moment allows us to be people who emerge with an anti-capitalist sensibility. But I figured, you know, uh, maybe that's a little bit too technical uh, to, to work out in 30 minutes, praise God. So then, you know, I kept reading, and, and then I got to the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalms 23, and uh, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. And I, I got all deep down in that passage. And then uh, John chapter 10 talked about Jesus calling and describing himself as the good shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd, and the sheep hear my voice, and they know me. Then he goes on to say, I am the gate. And so I was getting all excited about shepherds. And then as I continued to, to read through the passages, I, I got stuck in this particular passage of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, because it talked about suffering. And I felt very led and called to, to try and just open up some space in this preaching season uh, for us to imagine and continue to wrestle with how do we make it through this season of suffering and know that not only God is with us, but that suffering, I don't want to say is redemptive because I don't want to signal that it automatically has a redemptive result. But I do want to say that suffering can be redemptive, which then creates the space for what I believe is the possibility of God's resurrecting power to emerge 
from our current context. So that's where we're going to spend a few moments today uh, talking about uh, how we can make it on broken pieces. And, and certainly because this is the Sunday where we affirm our faith and our connection and community uh, through the breaking of the bread uh, that is the body of Jesus and the sharing of the wine that is the blood of Jesus, uh, all kinds of ways I'm hoping this message uh, really intersects today to help us appreciate that even through our brokenness, we can make it and we will emerge with a great sense of both hope, purpose, and possibility. So let's take a look then at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 19. Hopefully it does come up on your screen or you can follow along if you have a Bible on your phone or in your hands. But let's listen to what the Word of God says to us today. This is Peter talking to the church, uh, likely in Rome, undergoing great persecution. And Peter says this, for it is a credit to you if being aware of God. Somebody say, I must be aware of God. Say that. I must be aware of God. It is a credit to you if being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are being beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in Christ's footsteps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Speaking of Jesus. Verse 23 says, when Christ was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Verse 24 says, and Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed, for you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls." Oh, this is the word of God for us, the people of God, just in your room, in your living room, wherever you are, just say thanks be to God. So we're, we're going to take a few moments to try to open this passage up, uh, this lectionary passage, uh, helping us to wrestle a bit with uh, this sermon titled, We Can Make It on Broken Pieces. Let's pray together. God, we want to thank you for the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to please hide your word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And may, Lord, you make the preaching and teaching of your word be easy through the power and the anointing of your spirit. May it bless all those who are hearing, and may we be strengthened in ways we did not know we needed strength. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. That the people of the way say amen. Just put that in your chat. I can make it. We can make it on broken pieces. I, we can make it on broken pieces. Now, as I stated, the lectionary passage has some powerful characters, metaphors, descriptors that characterize human life and struggle. If you were to have read a few verses before, verse 19, you would have uh, heard and, 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 and read the very disturbing uh, passage that has been used across at least our life here in uh, the, 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 the modern era, excusing what it would seem, the brutality of slavery, where it says that slaves ought to obey your slave masters. It reinforces, it seems, a certain kind of hierarchy that <clears throat> dismisses violence. We see uh, the usage of, as I've already stated, the sheep and the shepherd, uh, the good shepherd and wandering sheep, if you will. We, we, we see in Psalms 23, as I mentioned, that uh, not only is the Lord is our shepherd, but the Lord leads us along still waters and restores our souls. But we still have to contend with the valley of the shadow 
of death. All of these metaphors, some disturbing, some life-giving, they, I think, represent the deep complexity of human life and struggle. And it is important for you and I to always appreciate that even as we go through the biblical text, as we attempt to make uh, uh, our lives and our, our, our walk with God, one that is indeed faithful, that we will have moments of dissonance. We will read and hear and experience life and the text, and it will feel incompatible. And this is why I believe it is always so important for us to appreciate the different uses of not only Scripture, but also the important use of our experiences. Because I do believe in some respects, Scripture is not always prescribing to us a certain response. It is also describing to us the kind of context that you and I are often, through no fault of our own, forced to live in and through. And yet, as we are living in and through our context, we must always be reminded that when dissonance comes, you and I must pause and ask some questions that hopefully can give you and I more information and guidance so we can indeed emerge out of the dissonant moments of life with greater clarity about what God is up to. And I want you to know today that even in the most difficult seasons of our lives, God is up to something. Uh, the, 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 the writers all through scripture find themselves continuously uh, in moments where they feel forsaken. They can't capture or catch up to what God is doing in the world. And yet by the time they get to the end of their life, you find more often than not them declaring a few things. Number one, God, you have been with me. You find them declaring that, God, you are faithful. You find them declaring that, God, I know that you will not fail me, but you will hold me up even as I make my transition to the other side. Now, I want you to appreciate, child of God, that when we talk about the challenges and struggles of human life, there is a whole division of theological discourse that is devoted to this conversation. That you and I do not have to start from scratch around the kind of inquiry and questions we will ask God. The theological category is called theodicy, T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y, theodicy. Just say it with me because I many of you be teased and talking about I use words that you don't know how to say. So just say theodicy. Yes, say that, theodicy. Type it in the chat, theodicy, T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y. It is the whole discourse of theological traditional conversations about why do Bad things happen to good people. How many of you have asked God that question at least once in your life? Amen. God, why is this happening to me? And I'm not talking about you asked that question when you, you know, up to no good. When you know, you know, uh, 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 sneak in and dip in and creep in. And, you know, you, you end up in a situation, you'd be like, yeah, I, I guess I deserve this. But you ask God these kind of questions when things don't seem to match up with either your intent or what you believe you're putting out in the world. Certainly many of us have been asking God these questions over the last several months as we have watched our loved ones and, and those who we know uh, wilt under the weight of not only the virus, which is in and of itself a daunting, daunting uh, ecological disaster, if you will, but we have also watched many of us in this country wilt and be crushed under the inept and wicked leadership of political leaders and corporate interests that have indeed prioritized their profits over our lives. 
And in these moments, if you're like me, you can ask yourself, God, where are you? This week, you know, when I was watching all these protests, and I'm not one who hates on protests of any kind because, you know, uh, for a good moment of my life, people called me a protester. <laughs> Amen. And folks, you know, didn't like that I was outside protesting and I was outside shutting stuff down and I was outside blocking streets and cars and running up into buildings and, 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 and interrupting things because I was so what I felt righteously uh, indignant about the conditions of injustice. So I'm not one that problematizes in a democracy the freedom of protest. But I do ask God, Lord, why is it that certain protesters get treated differently than others? I mean, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm not one of these folk who 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 thinks that, you know, even if you don't want to stay inside, that you don't have the right to protest and put yourself at risk. And even the 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 impact of that is to put others at risk. But in a democracy, you know, this is supposed to be uh, a part of our civil rights, our human rights, if you will. And 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 so I, I I can be a little bit, a little bit, you know, appreciative of that. But then I also start to ask myself. Why why is it that when we showed up with no weapons, uh, we got our heads cracked, and when they show up with weapons, they seem to get, you know, a lot of care, concern, and tenderness? Huh, I don't know if you ask yourself some of these questions. Why is it that the, the billions of dollars seem to, to be rushing into the coffers of the wealthy while many of us are still very much struggling to make it day to day? So this week, you know, as I was doing some reading and praying and thinking, I became particularly, particularly uh, moved by Psalms 37. And I'm just going to take a few moments to read through this psalm in our hearing because I think the words of the psalmist should become part of our daily liturgy for we who are trying to wrestle with the odyssey with the struggle of brokenness and disappointment both in our own lives and the lives around us and certainly in light of this system psalms 37 a great passage of scripture it says it like this and i think it may also be on the screen do not fret because of the wicked do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and God will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in the Lord, and the Lord will act. The Lord will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still. Listen to this. Verse 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their ways, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret for it only leads to evil. Verse number nine, for the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord, listen, shall inherit the land. <clears throat> there is indeed an inheritance that comes for those who wait for the Lord, that we will outlast the evildoers. Let me read a few more verses. Verse number 10, yet a little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. The wicked plot against the, the righteous and gnash their teeth at them, but the Lord laughs at the wicked. For the Lord sees that their day is coming. I want you and I to take as a, a, a certain kind of relief in your moments of theodicy that God's intentions for us who are struggling and who are asking questions, God's intent will outlast the wicked. God's faithfulness has a longer shelf life than the unfaithfulness of wicked leadership and profiteering interests that have run amok today. And in many respects, 
are surviving in a redemptive manner, meaning that we take the hurts and the struggles and the challenges that we are faced with, when we take them and we invite the can part of this possibility, the can be redemptive, that God can take all that we are dealing with. And even though it may hurt and it may raise questions, it can be redemptive. Can you just say that everything that I'm going through can be redemptive? Every one of my struggles can be redemptive. Every one of my questions, every one of the things that I've lost, all of the grief, the tears, and the pain, it can be redemptive. I love how Khalil Gibran, he declares that out of suffering have emerged the strongest souls. The most massive characters are seared with scars. That in many respects, as long as you and I can keep pushing through this, God will allow the thing the enemy meant for our evil. For our destruction, God can turn that thing around. You ought to right now, just remember how we sing that song where it said late in the midnight hour, God's going to turn it around. It's going to work in your favor. Some of you are like, oh, I don't understand how the turning around of this evil thing is going to work in my favor. I don't know either, but that's why I trust God to do a thing around the miraculous work of the suffering and the pain. So let's then take a few moments just to think through what the passage offers for us. In this moment, what must you and I wrestle with? How must we wrestle? How must we endure this season of the Rona, as they say, in order for us to make it on these broken pieces? I want to just give you three quick thoughts that in order for you and I to make it through this season, we must be thinking very deeply about what we must break free from, what we must be also uh, leaning into, and how you and I can emerge as wounded healers. I'll say that again. In this season, you and I must ask ourselves, what must we be free from? What must we live for? And how can we emerge as wounded healers? The first thing then that the scripture lifts up is a very powerful point of verse 24, where the writer, Peter, speaking pastorally to the people, is declaring, describing to them that all of your suffering when entrusted in the hands of the Almighty can cause the, 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 the real outcome to be freeing us from sins, from that which would leave us in bondage. Now, many of you that have been here at The Way for a while, you know, whenever we talk about sin, we're not just talking about those things that, that, that you know, uh, you, you may struggle with and the other person may struggle with. Your top ten things that you, uh, you know, tend to, to, to use as either a way to, to self-depreciate or criticize yourselves and others. Those things that, that are listed as the top ten sins, we're not just talking about those things. We have a very robust doctrine of harmatiology. Harm- as you will, harmatiology, sin in the Greek. And though the, 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 the way that I like to talk and we like to talk about sin at the way comes uh, 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 from uh, 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 a wonderful uh, Asian theologian, Simon Chan. I like the way he describes sin through the years. He says that there are three kinds of sin the follower of Jesus will contend with. There is the sin within us that is our flesh. There is the sin around us that is social injustice. And then there is the sin beyond us that is spiritual wickedness wrought by Satan, our adversary. So the sin within us, the sin around us, and the sin beyond us. Come on, I know you've done it a few times if you've been a member of the way for a while. But when we talk about being free from sin, we're talking about, say it with me, the sin within The sin around and the sin beyond us. 
that in many respects, you and I are being asked to break free from the sin within us, the sin around us, and the sin beyond us. Now, brokenness, uh, these, these ideas of being broken uh, can have pain attached to them, but they also have a connotation of possibility. For brokenness allows for the possibility of things that are one to be shared. Later on, in a few moments, we will take the bread that is the body of Jesus and we will say that this bread has been broken for you as a metaphor to declare that the efficacy, the, the, the power, the shared suffering of Jesus is broken for us. It is shared across that if it stayed in one piece, it may not be able to be consumed by all. But when we break it into pieces, we can share it. Brokenness leads to sharing. Brokenness also leads to healing. I want you to hear me on this point. While the pain that pre uh, that 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 comes before your healing is often realized through brokenness, it can be true that brokenness can and often does lead to the healing of that which has been broken. And brokenness also can release what is inside. If you've ever uh, broke a, 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 a bottle or, or something of, 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 of some perfume, and, and, and it falls on the ground, and, and then your whole room is overwhelmed by the precious fragrance that has been bottled up in that container. Brokenness can sometimes create some fissures for something beautiful to emerge. So when we talk about being free from sin, I want you and I to think about the ways in which this season is creating brokenness in our society. Brokenness in ourselves, in our families, in our relationships, and how we must be free from these things that are causing breaking. The sin within us, the vices, the self-destructive behavior, the harmful human relationships. In this season, my prayer for us is that we will emerge from this season with a greater clarity about the sin within us that we must break free from. And there is evidence all around us that you and I still have parts of our lives that need to be broken from us. When we see all of the statistics related to uh, intimate partner violence, when we see the still manifesting uh, realities of interpersonal violence, when we see the ways of, of human exploitation through trafficking or through uh, low-wage work or through the, the profiteering of the poor and the needy in a pandemic, it is an expression of the brokenness that is still at work in human hearts. And so you and I in this moment must be free from that brokenness. We also must be free from the brokenness and the sin that is around us. And child of God, we continue every day to still witness the police killings in a pandemic. How is it that those forces that cannot bring us food and masks can still figure out ways to hunt us down in the streets and use violence against us even in our most vulnerable moments? We must be free from the sin around us, free from the profiteering of the corporate and the wealthy and the wicked, free from the, the, the ineptness of a federal government that is intended in its purpose to try and give us the highest quality of life. We must ask ourselves, what in this moment must I be free from? And certainly we need to be free from the works of the devil, somebody. Amen. That wickedness, that, that spiritual wickedness that results from the diabolical plans of our adversary, our spiritual adversary. And so I want you to think about this question. What has the brokenness of this season revealed you to be free from? What has this brokenness shown you I need to be free from? 
I can't go back to a normal that was abnormal. I'm going to use this season of brokenness to do some inventory about what I need to be free from. And what ways of living must I break from if I am to emerge as a redeemed survivor? And I use that word intentionally, redeemed survivor, because I don't want you to believe or think that the brokenness you and I are enduring automatically becomes redemptive. No, it only becomes redemptive as we lean into this second point, which I want to lift up, that if we break free from sins, we must then be able to live for righteousness. Break free from to live free for. The scripture says in verse 24 that we might live for righteousness. I want you to imagine that the living for gives you and I an opportunity, an invitation into the kind of work that allows us to bridge to a right way of life. That all of us in this moment are starting to see the inefficacy, the deficiency, the gaps of the kind of world we've created. And although it may appear that the powerful have more influence over the world we've created, how many of you know if all of us made a commitment in this world that we would live for righteousness, not a kind of righteousness that is about personal piety, but a kind of righteousness that centers creation, a kind of righteousness that prioritizes the well-being of the whole and not the few. That we, if we were able to live for righteousness, we would prioritize healing of sick bodies and minds and spirits before we opened up the economic engines of a failed capitalistic system. That living for righteousness means that you and I would say, I want to prioritize justice. I want to prioritize mercy. I want to be generous. And in this moment, while we can clearly see the haves and the have nots, what would it look like for you and I to say, I, we will live for righteousness, right action, that we will live for a world bridging the gaps that allow for both abundance and shared prosperity. Meaning that to live for righteousness means that we must become the bridgers of the gaps that exist in our families, our societies, and the world. To you, for you to be a person to live for, for righteousness means that you break from a way of life that then allows that new energy being invested into a future not yet seen. That energy now becomes the power that allows us to bridge, to cover a gap or a distance with a new way of life that is sturdy enough for others to trust and cross over. I want you to think about that for a second. What kind of great power can you and I tap into that allows us to become bridgers in a world that has become experts in breaking? That you and I, just like the Bay Bridge, uh, just like the Brooklyn Bridge, just like all of these bridges uh, across the country, we trust that these bridges can bring us over the, the, the waters and the gaps that if fallen into could lead to our demise. We trust that these bridges are sturdy enough. Why? Because they've been carefully crafted by engineers and, and people with a certain kind of expertise. Could it be that God is calling for you and I to live for righteousness in a way that allows us to build bridges to a new world. 
out of the broken pieces that we have emerged from this season with. Oh, I'm here to tell you, you think you only got some brokenness? I'm here to tell you, bring your broken piece and lay it next to the broken piece of your sister and your brother and your loved one and let them, the power of God's spirit, fill in the gaps. You and I then can become the bridge through our brokenness to a world that must be created. So I want you to ask yourself in this moment, can you imagine a future to live for that is informed by what we broke from? What is the righteous way of life that you and I must commit to live into? You and I must make a commitment. I will not go back to that way again. But I'm going to live into something that is life-giving. I'm going to be a bridger to something that is life-giving. I'm going to use my time, my talent, my treasures, my temple, all that is placed within my hand, even the broken pieces that may be emerging from this season of, of grief and death and loss. I'm going to bring all of that and I'm going to trust, as this next point says, that I can live into this new season as a wounded healer. Last point, everybody say wounded healer. I just want you to appreciate, child of God, that when the scripture says, by his wounds, you and I have been healed, that Jesus, the paradigm of our existence as a, 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 a human being filled with the power of the living God, has the ability to absorb all of the evil and the death of its own experience and still emerge with the power to heal and to be resurrected and to be an agent of life and inspiration. I want you to know in this moment that you and I can with confidence say that I am healed by the wounds of Jesus. Meaning that if I identify myself with this one, then I can in the same way transfer the power that healed and raised him up in a way that brings healing now to the wounded around me even while I am still wounded myself that you don't have to be in a perfect situation and a perfect uh, uh, setup in order for you to be a source of healing but God even in your brokenness even in your challenge and even in your trial God can take your wounds and make them a source for healing. Oh, I love how Augustine, he said it like this, that as Jesus hung on the cross and his enemies were raging, he hung there yet at the same time he was healing them. That the power of Jesus is at Work in you and I that even while you suffer and even while you find yourself in an in-between season of, of, of dealing with the struggle and the loss, that while you are going through, you can still be healed and be a source of someone else's healing. That as the writer says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that with the same consolation that Christ offers to you, you now can offer it to someone else. Else. I want you to know, child of God, that it is a constant paying it forward of sorts. That God is saying that I'm going to give you some healing and I'm going to give you some peace and I'm going to give you some resurrection. I'm going to just wink at you from time to time and I'm just going to remind you that trouble don't last always. I'm, I'm going to answer some of your most difficult inquiries while you're going through some of your most difficult challenges challenges but as you go through it I hear God saying to you today that as I heal you I want you to heal somebody else as I bring you out I want you then to be the source of bringing others out I hear God saying that as I bring and unleash the healing in your brokenness that God wants you to testify that while I was broken God healed my body while my mind was troubled God healed my body 
while my heart was torn to shreds, God healed my body. And it was the healing power of God that welled up through the broken cracks of my life. And now I can declare that I'm not healed just because of happenstance, but I am healed because of the source power of the creator of heaven and earth. Do I have anybody that can just look back and testify that God healed my mind when I was broken in two? God brought me back together again when I thought I was not going to rise from that place of disappointment God brought me out of the horrible pit it was God that kept telling me you're going to make it it was God that kept encouraging me and saying that you can make it hold on you can make it Go through the valley. You can make it. Go through the fire. You can make it. Go through the flood. Why? How can you make it? Because I hear the word of the Lord say that I will be with you when you go through the valley. I will be with you when you go through the flood. I will be with you when you go through the fire and have no worry you will rise again we are a resurrected people that can have this great confidence uh, that God will uh, bring you back uh, from your place uh, of death and despair. Uh, God will uh, bring us back uh, from this place of corona. Uh, God will uh, bring us back uh, to a world uh, that we must create together. Uh, so tell your neighbor, uh, tell yourself, uh, tell your family, uh, tell your friends, uh, you can make it on some broken pieces because God is the glue that can bring it all back together again. Shout hallelujah. You and I can make it through this season even with our questions, even with our brokenness, even with our trials. One great writer her name, her name, her name was, I believe her name was Sister Fisher. No, Mary Earl. Sister Mary Earl, Reverend Mary Earl. She says it like this, that each person, each illness is a particular story full of sacred meaning. That every experience you and I will go through, though hard and difficult it is, it is a expression, a story filled with sacred meaning. So how then do you and I emerge as wounded healers? Oh, I think it makes sense. Get connected to a community of wounded healers. Find you some folk. It may be in a belonging group. Maybe in a therapeutic group but find you a group of folk who are committed even in their woundedness to being healers. <laughs> Seek spiritual direction or coaching from a skilled and trained healer. Just like the skilled and trained builders built the bridge, find you a skilled and trained healer to offer spiritual direction. Memorize scriptures and quotes about healing and peace with all the bad news you hear why don't you make your mind become a living persistent recorder of the promises of God's healing and peace in our lives and if you're going to be a wounded healer listen be gentle with yourself be gentle with yourself be gentle with yourself just as God is gentle and tender with us. This is a time where you and I 
can be reminded of the many ways that we are invited into a season of healing, a season of brokenness, but also still a season of bridging. Come on and take a few moments. Take a few moments and thank the Lord. We thank you for this great sacrifice. We thank you for this great offering, this great, Lord, fellowship of the body and the blood of the people of God, both here and afar. Thank you, Lord. On this great Sunday, we can declare together that we are united by the shared work that you've done on our behalf. May our strength, may our unity, may our shared lives, Lord God, may they be glued together by the grace and the sweet communion of your spirit. Heal us, strengthen us, make the broken pieces of our lives fit together for a future we must build that gives glory to you and to all of your divine purposes. And we'll thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. We love you with the love of the Lord, people of the way. I pray that you find some broken pieces this week that become the opportunity for healing, that become the opportunity for the bridging that we must do together. Find the broken pieces of your lives and say, I am a wounded healer. Even in this season, God can take all that I have and bring great life from it in Jesus' name. We love you with the love of the Lord. Listen, I pray that we all gather once again in our belong groups all week, our Bible study groups, and on Wednesday night, meet us. Meet us at 7 p.m. Pre-register. Uh, reach out to Pastor Erna, to our leadership team, so we can give you all the information you need to join us. But let us, let us, let us join together on this particular Wednesday for our first all-church huddle. And let's get some good updates and fellowship in the name of the Lord. We love you, people of the way. Stay blessed. Be encouraged. God, as we leave this place of fellowship on YouTube and Facebook and other digital platforms, I pray that we'll never leave your presence. And may God, our fellowship, continue to be sweet in these seasons of challenge. We love you, God. And we say thank you. Remind us of your great love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you people the way we love you.